You are supposed to be strained. Not because you shout when you're praying. No, no. You're supposed to be strange because the results on your life are unpredictable. You're supposed to be strange because you, you make ways where there are no ways. You're supposed to be strange because you make the impossible become possible. You're supposed to be strange because you know how to level valleys and flatten mountains. That's what makes you strange. You're supposed to be strange because you do things normal men cannot do. The Bible says, counsel in the heart of a man is as deep waters. But only that man with understanding can draw it out. That means you can have a lot in your spirit, but never be able to draw it out. You can have a lot inside you, but never be able to draw it out. You can have a lot of potential in your life, but never be able to draw it out. You can have a healing anointing, but never be able to draw it out. You can have a revelation anointing, but you may never be able to draw it out. You can have an evangelistic grace on your life, but you might never be able to draw it out. You might have a business uh, grace on your life to make wealth like the world has never seen, but you might never be able to draw it out. Why? Because you need understanding. The Bible says, but only a man with understanding can draw it out. You see? Deep waters. Bottomless waters. You carry a depth that is infinite in a finite body. Are you following what I'm saying? You must understand what's inside you. But if understanding is not there, you will stay a normal and predictable entity on the earth. So I came to give you understanding. Paul has said, I has not seen, ear has not heard, it has not entered in the heart of man the things that God has prepared for you who love him. And the Bible says he has revealed it to us by his spirit. So that means we carry a revelation of what eye has not seen, ear has not heard, has not entered the hearts of men. Yet even with us, we carry no understanding of it. We carry no understanding of it. Or perhaps we don't even have the vision of it. So perhaps even our eyes have not seen what God has prepared and revealed to us. There's a difference between what your eyes, intellect, is able to see, your mind is able to understand, versus what God has placed in the inside of your spirit. Those two things are different. Are you following what I'm saying? There's a difference between the voice of the spirit and the voice that you are able to hear from your level of interpretation there's a difference between what god has deposited in the inside of you of your spirit and the meditations of your heart sometimes or many a time these are two different paradigms or realms but only understanding can connect you to draw out this is what i saw years ago when the Lord took me through that portion of scripture, he made a statement that I want to give you tonight. And if you understand this, you'll write history. Let me explain it. If there are many pastors in the world what makes you different? What makes you exceptional? What makes you distinctive? If there are many worshippers in the world, what makes you different? What makes you exceptional? What makes you distinct? If there are many businessmen in the world, what makes you exceptional? What makes you different? What makes you distinct? The seed of greatness has a very deep vibration of interpretation. That doesn't mean that you will write over men to say, I'm better than you. No, that's not what God is saying. In fact, the Bible says, if any of you require to be the greatest, you must be least. 
but at least the kingdom of God has a definition called greatest. You don't take it away. Because it doesn't fit your structure, you don't take it away. He just told us to be least. The humility of the spirit and all these things are key in building the individual you are. Are you following what I'm saying? But God has called you to be different. Like in the world, we have, you have, for example, in your physical world, you have a different thumbprint from your neighbor. That makes you different. But that doesn't make you exceptional. That doesn't make you distinct. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when the Bible says that you shall be the head and not the tail, what does it mean? Does it mean that you'll only, does it only end in your classroom that you'll be the first in class? It's more than that. Because some of the students who are first in class have not made it in life, and you can agree. When the Bible says that you shall be the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath. That's what the Bible says. It means that there is a plan for God to put you first in the world that you might become a light to the darkness in the world and by that you might be able to draw many to the saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ do you agree? because if we are no more how do we draw them? if we are predictable how do we draw them? already God called you a chosen generation a peculiar people isn't it that you should show forth the praises of him that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light that you should show forth what makes you peculiar the word they're peculiar is strange you are supposed to be strange not because you shout when you're praying no no you're supposed to be strange because the results on your life are unpredictable. Are you following what I'm saying? You're supposed to be strange because you, you make ways where there are no ways. You're supposed to be strange because you make the impossible become possible. You're supposed to be strange because you know how to level valleys and flatten mountains. That's what makes you strange. You're supposed to be strange because you do things normal men cannot do. Somebody shout hallelujah. That's the strangeness that I'm talking about. But there has to be something that makes you different. You must be marked. You must carry a distinctive grace on your life. Otherwise, you be like everybody and God hates mediocrity he wants the best out of you somebody shout hallelujah if we had a thousand prophets what would make you different if we had a thousand evangelists what would make you different apostles what would make you different what would make you different? Is it because you go to church? Everybody goes to church. Is it because you give in the church? Everybody gives. Is it because you help the poor? Some people help the poor. Are you following what I'm saying? But there has to be, and all of that is good, but there has to be something to make you distinct. The Bible says, there are, it may be, many voices in the world. But there's none without significance. Somebody shout hallelujah. There are many sounds and voices. Did you know that you are a sound? You individually are a sound. But the Bible says, but there's none without signification. Every sound has a meaning. But the Bible says, therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, the Bible says, I shall be unto him the voice that speaketh a barbarian. And he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. 
That is the power that connects you to men. There are three great powers that every man should have. One is power over yourself. In the fruit of the spirit, we call that self-control. Before you control anything in this world, you must have power over your appetites, power over your passions, power over your pleasures, power over your cravings, power over your emotions, power over your psychological interpretations and perceptions of life, power over your flesh, power over your soul, restraint. Do you understand what I'm saying? Godly character. A patterned and disciplined life. Today you're praying over the conference. It was so nice. I'm going to go back and pray. The pastor told us to pray. Let me go back and pray. And then you go back to one month, one week, or oh no, some of you, two days. <laughs> you're, you're like, I don't know whether you've seen how, I, I call them the, the New Year resolution blues. That's my own term. You know those people who wake up and say, New Year resolution, I'm going to lose weight. And then in, Jan, in January, you see them running. By second week January, they are back to their food. <laughs> Until next year, then they say, no, 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 this year, New Year resolution. I am losing weight. Two weeks, they are back. Oh, this year I'm going to read a book every month. Wah. First week, two weeks. Pooh. It opens in June. And then they remember they read two pages. But I said, I'm going to read Fire God, Devil, leave me. And then you read two, say, ten pages, and then boom. And then it opens in November. And then you say, no, this year, this coming year, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And then the next year comes, New Year resolution, reading a book every month. <laughs> oh, maybe you're holy, I've been through that. <laughs> but the Lord delivers slowly, hallelujah. Not books, but other things. I am a reader, you see. Praise the Lord Jesus. But are you following what I'm trying to tell us here? Are you following what I'm trying to tell us? The second power is power over the gifts, physical and spiritual, that God will give you. What do you do when you have a healing anointing? Do you use it for transaction? If you don't pay me, I'm not going to pray for you. What do you do with your gift of singing? Do you worship in, 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 in church? Do you use it to benefit people or you, it's, it's a destruction for the world? What do you use your wealth for? The possessions, physical and spiritual. You must have power over them. Because if you don't, they can destroy you. Do you know there's, just, there's a young man right now, if he got just $100,000, he can die. He's just... No, 100 is a lot. $10,000 is enough to kill him. He'll drink himself and die. You see? So he has no control over what the Lord has what? Given him. Praise the Lord Jesus. We've had experiences. That's the Holy Ghost. <laughs> we, we've had experiences where they were humble before the glory came. They were approachable before the anointing came. And when the anointing came, they became different men. They cannot control what God has given them. Number three is power over men. There's a lot of power to be able to tell thousands, come tomorrow and they will hear to be able to tell people that this is what we're going to do and they will not ask you how or where let's go because there are people who in their sack of influence cannot control even their wife only their wife only their husband only their child just one child you, just one you have this boy he, come no he goes that side, you chase him. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. God has called us to have power over men. How we use that power 
like Paul says, is a liberty to serve them. Don't forget that. Not to control them. To serve them. Jesus drew men to him to serve them. Now that's the irony of the kingdom versus the world. Because the world has power to control politically, socially, economically, influence, influencing, uh, manipulation, Jezebel. Because it's manipulative. It's mind controlling. It's everything else controlling you. You understand what I'm saying? But back to this. Why do we need that power? Why? You see, when Jacob wrestled with God, you remember his wrestling with God? He said, Thou has wrestled with God and overcome. And he says, Thou art set above the princes, for you have obtained power with God and with man. Power with God and with man. Power with God and with man. So it's not wrong. The only question is, how do you use that power? God can bring those people to you that you will work with them to push the kingdom of God to the next level. But whether you want it or not, there are people who have a lot of power in this world and they're using it to destroy. Now, he said there are many voices in the world, but you can be barbarian. That is why somebody can listen to you and not believe you. Yet you're speaking the truth. And another one can see you and believe you. You're not barbaric, he's not barbaric. Or somebody can speak to you and you don't understand them. Or somebody can speak to you and you understand them. Now the reconciliation of understanding even as you are understood is a great mystery. Because nothing, nothing connects you to the world like understanding that's the multitude of counsel the Bible says in the multitude of counselors there is safety it's not just the people who counsel you it's the depths of counsels that are available because understanding is available if you are a minister and they cannot understand you neither can you understand them how can you draw them Do you understand what I'm saying? And I'm not talking about understanding in language. I'm talking about understanding spiritually. It's called connecting. Are you following what I'm saying? Those are not things a gift does. Because a gift will create room for you, but it won't build a house. There's a difference. <laughs> it, it won't enlarge the room. There's another glory to enlarge it. And it's the authority of the spirit that only comes from a man or woman who God has dealt with concerning the anointing. To understand the anointing that draws things and people to you. And your heart is consecrated enough not to abuse it. Now, he says, even things without life. Are you hearing? Even things without life except whether pipe or harp except they give a distinction in sounds now the distinction comes now what makes them different comes you remember the question I asked you what makes you different what makes you exceptional what makes you distinct and Paul began with the things that don't have life the things that don't have life he says even the things without life giving sound whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in sounds. The Bible says, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? Oh my goodness, grammar. He did not say what shall be known, which is the pipe and which is the harp. Your title is not important. He said what is piped, what is harped, your purpose is important. Even if you simply call me grace, it doesn't take away the anointing on my life. Because it's not the title on the tin, it's the content. Somebody shout hallelujah. 
and we're dealing with a generation that is so interested in being called titles if you don't call him bishop he can't walk if you, if you don't call him pastor he won't answer you're disrespecting me and breaking biblical order call me prophet if you don't call me prophet you will die and the man says Jesus save me and Jesus saves him he doesn't mind to add add Lord add rabbi you understand what I'm saying the titles are not important it's a substance it's not the separation of the harp from the pipe that's division in the church it is the understanding of what is harped what is piped what is the distinctive voice that you carry in this world what makes your message different for if the trumpet giveth an uncertain sound who shall prepare himself for war oh, if a trumpet gives an uncertain sound who shall prepare himself for war now the mandate of this trumpet was to blow to prepare men for the sound of war and it gave an uncertain sound and in the time when men were supposed to prepare for war they stood back and the enemy came and ravaged them and killed them why because there was a trumpet perhaps that could not give the right sound who understands what i'm saying or there was even a trumpet worse off that probably did not have a sound because he did not know that it was a trumpet or even worse there was a trumpet trying to harp Who has understood what I just said? There was a trumpet trying to harp. He's an evangelist, but he's, he's fighting to be a pastor because he admires to be a pastor. To be available does not mean that you should perform in every function because you are desired or demanded to. Not every open door you should enter. Peter opened the door to the Gentile church, but he was not called for the Gentile church. Who knows that? He opened the door in the house of Cornelius, the Italian man, but he was not called for the Gentile church. But it takes a certain understanding to know Peter that this might be, you know, that one of used of you by God to open, but you were not called for the Gentile church. And we hear one day he went to Rome and the stories that are told by historians is was that he was killed in Rome. And there's a reason why he was killed in Rome. He was not supposed to leave Jerusalem. Oh no, you have read of Paul. The Bible says every time he went into the synagogues, he was beaten. Those were Jews, Paul. Why were you called? Sometimes we even attract unnecessary persecution. And the Jews and proselytes, which were in Judea, when they heard that I was in Lystra, they came and beat me up. What were you doing in the synagogues? God had called you to the Gentile. Stick to the Gentile. Keep hopping. Don't pipe. You mess it up. Your message is good, but where has God called you? Are you following what I'm saying? For me, it's important. It doesn't matter where, but let me be where God wants me to be. It might not pay me, but those who know me, know me. And if you've not found your distinction, you have not yet fully understood the mystery of divine purpose. somebody shout hallelujah now let me let me give you a little sneak preview of something I, I preached recently in church but i just touched and i feel i want to build something out of that i told our members that when god comes to mary and tells her that you are going to have a child mary asks a question and says how shall it be seeing that i know no man now, that is not a statement of unbelief. Rather, it is actually a statement of or a question trying to understand the distinctiveness of divine purpose. Because in human history, from the creation of the earth, to that age she had never seen God do that 
it has never happened to anybody since the creation of the ages for a woman to conceive without a man some see her unbelief but the true vision of Mary the true the true way you should see it is that it had never happened before or that what was known was that a woman would only conceive through copulation being one with a man and now we have a mystery something is coming you are going to carry a child without sleeping with a man that had never happened so the words of surrender be done unto me according to thy will and after Mary it had never it has never happened it gave her a distinction unfortunately some venerated it instead of building understanding for their part do you understand what I'm saying I gave an example and I told them the day Jesus opened the blind man the blind man's eye the Bible said that it had never been seen in human history that a blind eye had opened I showed it recently in my church meaning that even when we believe that with God all things are possible and any miracle that had ever happened from the beginning of the earth to that time they had never seen a blind man see of any miracle the Elijah's raised dead people but they had never seen a blind man see that was the first time they saw a blind man see it had never happened before somebody shout hallelujah I wish I could get you that portion of scripture but time might fail me if you, somebody can get it for me quickly it had never happened in the history of mankind that a blind eye was opened. So, for those of us who had believed, or for those of them which had believed that with God all things are possible, at least that's the one miracle they had never seen. And it became a distinctive mark in the miraculous ministry of Jesus. Did somebody find that portion of scripture for me? Thank you. Uh huh. Let's read. Since the world began, it had not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born. Nobody, born blind. Nobody had ever done that. Nobody has ever had ever done that. Somebody shout hallelujah. That is why in the vindication of the Christ, and Jesus sends this message in Luke 7 22 John has sent people to ask go and find out from this fellow who is he what does he do in verses 22 Jesus answered them and said go your way and tell John the things that you have seen and heard one how the blind see because it's important for John to know that there's a guy who is opening blind eyes. How the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised. And to the poor, the gospel is preached. Raising the dead was second last. And let me tell you, I can share my own personal story. I walked through every miracle I had known. But quite honestly, in my healing ministry, me, quite honestly, in my healing ministry, I think it took me close to seven years healing, but I've never seen a blind eye. I first saw a blind eye open after almost seven years of healing. So I know what I'm telling you. And you ask anybody walking in the healing grace, ask anybody and tell them how many blind have you seen? You'll understand how hard <laughs> or interesting that miracle is. And don't even get me started if I talk about giving sight to the blind spiritually. 
because let's talk about the physical eye this eye opening my goodness i'm not saying it's not possible but i want you to know it's a distinctive grace i'm telling you i'm telling you that's one miracle even a false healing man can never perform opening a blind eye you go study oh this guy false prophets why they don't open blind eyes they don't they can't do anything but this eye to give this thing vision study it and even deeper you remember what i shared yesterday paul says to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery He's praying for the church in Ephesians that the eyes of your understanding will be flooded with light for Tiso that you might know what is the hope of your calling, what are the glorious riches of inheritance of the saints, what is the exceeding greatness of power which is at work within you who believe. But it begins from the eyes of their understanding being flooded with light that you will know because a man can never truly know without vision. So the blind sea is not just physical, but it also has a spiritual connotation. That gave the healing ministry of Jesus a distinctive mark. The Elijahs had raised dead bodies. It had happened before. But that was the day they saw what I had not seen. So are you connecting to where I'm coming from? Do you understand what I'm saying? A mark came in human history that had never happened before. When we talk about Mary and, and her conception, that was the day the earth saw what eye has not seen. And then you go back in human history, biblical history, and then you see distinctive graces. Moses gave the church or the people the commandments. No man, no man has repeated that except in the days of Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? And in how again he comes to fulfill what God had put on Moses he says I didn't come to do away with the law but I came to fulfill it nobody can touch the distinction on Moses and the Lord started to show me the altar the spirit the heart behind that distinction I started to study Moses not as a man but as a man of God I started to study his prayer life I started to study his spirit I started to understand why the Bible says that he was the most humble man on the earth I understood what brokenness was I studied his place of relationship with God. He tells Aaron and Miriam, when I speak to prophets, I speak to them in visions and dreams, but that's not how I speak to Moses. He never spoke to Moses in a vision and in a dream. The Bible says he spoke to him mouth to mouth and the very similitude of God he beheld. This man would sit in the anointing and sit in the presence of God for days and he comes back and his face is radiating because of the glory of God upon his life. And he has both the revelation of grace and the law. That's why in Deuteronomy, the Bible says the righteousness of faith speaks this wise. And it is Moses speaking. So he knows the difference between the righteousness of faith and the righteousness of works. And he sees where God is going. And he's preparing his spirit to prepare men to take them where they must understand. But he's beyond the law. He has the understanding beyond the law. That's why he says, this shall be a testimony against you. He didn't say against us. Are you following what I'm saying? Because, he, oh, we, that Moses had a distinction. So I went to study this man as the distinctive mark to understand what, why do you think I was studying that? Why do you think I was studying that? I wanted to understand the pattern to get my own distinction. Hashabara de go sika para de go sila mara de go shita. Rap para de go santo sira barala. 
Rekete bozigarata kusharara. Reparanto sikaraba. You are different. You just don't know yet. You have a distinction on your life. You just don't know yet. This is not for special men. This is for all of us who dare to believe. Because in the New Testament, he has revealed it to us. It's not an exclusivity of anointing. In the New Testament, there are no exclusivities. In the New Testament, we are all included. That's the only difference. Are you following what I'm saying? Are you following what I'm saying? Then, let me give you another example. You look at Paul. And Paul says, like a master builder who has given me this grace <laughs> to lay the foundation of the gospel. No other man will ever lay. Paul even warned, let no foundation be laid again. Don't waste time going deep. You can only build higher. Don't waste time. That's his distinction. The church of Jesus Christ since then has been building on Paul. And interestingly, the Lord showed me we are just building on his letters. I wonder how those who sat under him received. Because it's, you know, historians tell you Paul would speak for six hours. There were no timers those days. Praise God. You understand what I'm saying? Six hours. Now, if the church of Jesus Christ, the institution of the church, billions of men have come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through a man's letters, what were his sermons like? And what manner of consecration would a man need? And then you see the pattern of the wilderness. After the conversion in Damascus, immediately God takes him to Arabia. Like the distinction of Moses. After killing a man in the what? In the sun, God takes him to the desert too. Like the distinction of Abraham. God takes him out of his father, kin, his, his father's house, kin, folk, and nation, and takes him to Canaan. And we see one dis oh. Don't even get me started on Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness because now you're connecting. That with every distinction, there is a consecration that throws a man in the wilderness and three things happen in the wilderness. Oh, God kills you. Number two, he teaches you to understand his voice so that he can instruct you and show you things no man can show you. But number three, he tries you to maturity. And, and, and that will also take some of the people you're going to work with who have nasty attitudes. And God tells you, be patient with him. And a man will attack you on social media and God tells you, don't touch him. Don't touch him. And somebody will offend you and God tell, like I remember one day, somebody hurt me. They really hurt me so bad. And I was praying in anger. I said, God, how could this person do this to me? And the Lord told him, sign him. Saul told me, sign him a check. <laughs> what? Sign him a check. You're a father to your generation. Is it really you speaking? told me can the devil tempt you to give ah, ah, ah. sorry you know sometimes we call sometimes God speaks and we say devil get behind me get, be, get behind me devil get, go 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 so I wrote this man a check I sent it and he stayed doing the same The Lord told me, write another. This time I was sure it was God. So I didn't waste this time. But there are poor people who 
need this money? Why this guy? And God tells me there's still a place where I'll reconcile all things. And eventually, this man will know me through what you did. He told me this, this, this only such things restore such men. Give it time. I'm still waiting. Patiently for the Lord to explain to me one day why he made me do this. But if you have not gone through the, the wilderness, you cannot do it. I'm almost finishing. Only because of time. I want us to pray. That's what I mean. Somebody shout hallelujah. And, and honestly, my words are running out. So I've been given two, two sessions in one. Praise God. Now, so I started a poll as my specimen of distinction. What was the spirit at work on this man? What were his lines of prayer? What was the degrees of consecration that he went through? How did he see the world? And I start to look for what I call the hidden instructions that not many are able to see. I see his leadership style. And then I studied Jesus, our master. And I asked myself this question. Why would he leave Mary with John? John was not Mary's biological son. Yet James, the chief apostle of Jerusalem, was around. And Judah, his brothers. Why would he tell Mary, this is your son? And why would he tell John, this is your mother? And the Bible says, and that day John took Mary to his house. Why would your mother, James, be raised or looked after in another man's house? Patterns. We're trying to understand what made these people different and the, the Lord showed me quite a lot and I cannot tell you that I've gotten it all but so far what I have done with what I know is working it's working it's working I can teach a pattern of prayer on that I can teach a pattern of consecration on that I can teach a pattern of vision on that I can teach a pattern of ministry on that. I can teach a pattern of wisdom, revelation and knowledge on that. Because I, I, I see and I'm still learning. Remember the theme. My purpose. Perhaps maybe you came to a conference to discover whether you are an apostle of a prophet or a teacher. But what if you came to a conference for God to give you a distinctive mark that has never happened in human history? You got it. You got it. You got it. Why do you think when they prophesy about Jesus, everybody's marveled, but the Bible says Mary keeps it in her heart. The consecration of a heart that can understand the things spoken of this man explains the reason why she was the chosen womb. <laughs> it also explains why she provoked the first miracle outside the will of God because Jesus said woman do you not know that it's not yet my time and she just stand and tell him tell whatever he tells you to do do that means I'm not uh, oh, 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 oh. I'm not ready whether it's time for God to do a miracle or not I raised this guy miracle happened so the first miracle in human history happened outside God's timing that the earth had never seen again. 
we had never read anywhere where a miracle happened outside God's time. Mary showed us that a man by faith can actually provoke God to do something that is not in his plan. Oh, how dare you? How dare not I? <laughs> Mary did it. Was she judged? No. Understand the mystery of faith. Actually, without faith, it's impossible to please God. That means the realm of faith can actually transcend beyond the timings of the Spirit. And then I saw it as I conclude. I has not seen. Ear has not heard. It has not entered the hearts of men. The things God has prepared to them that love him. And he has revealed it. If you didn't get it, now you've gotten it in this conference. By his spirit. For the spirit which searches the deep things of God went out and searched out and defined your mark. It's inside your spirit. Now you're going to pray it out. This is what God wants to do. The world might never understand it now. It might understand it 10 years. It might understand it 20 years. It might understand it 30 years. But I know by the day I leave this earth, I'll have a different mark on my life. I know it. Now, that doesn't make me better than you. No. I was raised by God to help some of us understand that this is for all of us who are able to take it. It's not a special man. I'm not special. There's nothing special about me. My labors as a man of God in my part, because every man has their part, is to invite men to such places. To draw a standard for them but not a limitation. I'm not a limit to any man. No. We draw the standard and God perhaps through this sermon can raise a man even higher than I have gone and that's okay but the fact that you can get a hold of this I don't care whether you're 8 or 9 God will have to wait to take you I don't care whether you're 60 God will have to wait to take you I don't care whether you're 55 God will have to wait to take you telling God one more Give me a distinction to do something the earth has never seen before. Because with him all things are possible. Let me tell you the danger about such summons. The danger about such summons is many can believe it. But not many are bold enough to ask for it. Now I want to provoke you to be bold enough to ask for it. Tell God, give me a mark. Do something. If it's a revelation, give me a revelation that has never been preached. Give me a, a sermon that no man has ever preached before. Give me a prophetic realm that no man has ever walked before. Give me a worship, oh, that no man has ever worshipped before. Give me a vision like no man has ever seen before. Give me a revelation like no man has ever had before. Give me an understanding like no man has ever had before. And it is possible. If we do that, we will not worry about the revival of Europe. Somebody shout hallelujah. Because they will come to see what God has done. He says, behold, I do a new thing. <laughs> Glory to God. He says, behold, I do a new thing. What do you think he meant? In you. In you. The Spirit of God says, I want to do something. God says, I'm not out. I've not run out of revelation. I've not run out of works. I'm bottomless. Even when you think you have known, I can still do something out of you that has never been done before in the world. The day that this man stopped the sun, they never knew that it was possible for a man through prayer to stop the sun. 
Was it Joshua? Who? Yes. The day Joshua stopped the sun. Nobody believed that it was possible for a man to say, hold up the sun until we kill all the enemies of Israel. Are you following what I'm saying? God do something in our time. That will, oh, that those who hear us will write one day and say, that one day in one season, in one generation, there was a certain man, there was a certain woman who had something on him. And God did something through that man, through some three, that woman that the world had never seen before. And when he does it, we'll stay broken and humble and hungry for more. He won't exalt us. It will bring glory to him. But I dare you to believe tonight.